All right, this lecture is on uh, simulation interoperability. As we discussed all the evolution of simulation in virtual and the constructive or wargaming sense, we started getting an idea of how many virtual level simulators and wargames are out there. And I mentioned the fact that we got to have them working together. Specifically, when you have something like a tank simulator and an aircraft simulator, and let's say the aircraft is an A-10 Warthog, you want that A-10 Warthog to swoop down on tank simulators and blast them. Well, if you have two simulations that were built and they can't exchange data, that's just totally frustrating. So the military is in the process and has been for very actively for over 10 years of making interoperability standards that will force these simulations to operate together. This kind of started with an idea that jumped out of Jack Thorpe's head when he was working at DARPA. Jack Thorpe envisioned a world where you took virtual simulators, war games, training devices, and real world equipment and you had them all sharing information over some kind of internet backbone so that they all appeared to be working in the same virtual environment. And this is one of the first diagrams that he made of that idea. And if you look at it now, it is the kind of thing that we're trying to accomplish with the HLA runtime infrastructure and some of the other standards that we're proposing in the military simulation community. Here are some of the interoperability standards as they evolved. Uh, we mentioned that SimNet was a simulator. Well, it was also a simulation protocol. As they built all these network simulators, they realized they need some kind of standard interoperability protocol to tell each other where they are on the battlefield and what they're doing. And so SimNet was also the name of the protocol that supported those networked operations. That was followed close thereafter by distributed interactive simulation. And under distributed interactive simulation, we tried to steer a little bit away from the tank-centric way of viewing the battlefield. We tried to include objects and events that tanks wouldn't engage in, but that helicopters, jets, and ships might engage in. Tried to make it more generic, more jointly or oriented, so that the Air Force and the Marine Corps and the Navy could all use the same protocol, rather than relying on an Army protocol, which was what SimNet primarily was. Uh, on, at the same time, there was a thing called the Generic Data System, which was being developed at the Warrior Preparation Center. The Warrior Preparation Center in Germany owned a copy of each of these services major staff training war games and they were trying to get them all to talk to together so they were developing a protocol of their own well also the joint training confederation was being formed up kind of in parallel to that and they invented a protocol called the aggregate level simulation protocol well, now we have one standard, DIS, and another standard, ALSP. One meant for virtual simulators, the other meant for aggregate simulators. And that just wasn't good enough for unification. So the high-level architecture came out. The high-level architecture uses a thing called the runtime infrastructure, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. But that single software package, that is the RTI, is meant to support both virtual level simulations and constructive level simulations and war games that are used for analysis. <clears throat> Those are the protocols primarily for interoperability during a war game. Uh, there are two other protocols that emerged around the same time. The first was the command and control simulation interface language. And it's very similar to the DIS network packets in that it's trying to capture information that needs to be exchanged by two brains, two commanders, two automated um, AI-like models of command behaviors, trying to say things in, in words that can be understood by an AI computer. And then that was followed up by CEDRUS, uh, Synthetic Environment Data Representation and Interchange Specification. Uh, it's essentially trying to define one way to describe terrain data, one way to describe environmental data, meaning the terrain, the weather, the ocean state, even trees and buildings and vehicles so that you can get, represent every virtual environment with the same objects. And we'll get into that near the end as well. I mentioned that uh, this kind of started with Jack Thorpe. There's a story out, I don't know how true it is, that uh, Jack Thorpe walk, walked into an arcade one day and saw Battlezone playing 
and said, that's what I want to build. Battle Zone was in the arcades around 1980, and it was the first time that you could move 3D into an arcade game. You didn't just move two-dimensional back and forth on the screen, but you went in and out of a virtual world. And it was a very simple virtual world, just mountains dr drawn by lines and tanks drawn by lines. But it gave the idea that there's a 3D world in front of you. And that was, in some stories, that was the seeds that made people say, we're going to build SimNet and it's going to be a much more realistic military quality trainer like you see at Battlezone in the arcades. From there, we ended up at DIS, which I mentioned earlier, or described earlier. It's trying primarily to address virtual level simulators, tanks, aircraft, helicopters, soldiers, vehicles, that kind of thing. It's primarily intended to tie them all together in one virtual environment so they can be shooting at each other and exchanging fuel with each other and marching side by side and all that kind of stuff that would support a joint environment. It provides a common digital environment. You don't pump terrain data, for example, around in the DIS protocols. If you have two virtual level simulators, you load each one of them with their simulation specific, system specific representation of the terrain. And then you fire them up. Now, if those two representations are accurate or uh, if they correspond to each other, then both of those simulators will look out on the same virtual world. It's very possible for those two terrain databases to be very different and for the world to look very different depending on which simulator you're sitting in. Well, that was one of the things that uh, DIS kind of caused this as a rule. The rule was you have to have compatible terrain databases. It didn't give you a mechanism to create that compatibility. That doesn't come late until later under CEDRUS. <coughs> And then they want to support a fair fight between multiple simulators. You can imagine if you're writing the algorithms for uh, engagement and this other person's writing the algorithms for engagement in their simulator, that your two algorithms are going to be slightly or greatly different. And so when the two of you get into a gunfight and you start shooting at each other, it's possible that your algorithms allow you to be killed much more readily than his algorithms allow, allow him to be killed. And so you end up in a battle where you're the soft target and he's the hard target and that's not the way it is in the real world. So you want to make <coughs> simulators that represent vehicles in the same way, from one system to the next system to the next system, or at least in compatible ways. And finally, you want real-time execution, no perceptible lag. You want to be able to publish information about the changes in the battlefield and deliver those to the other simulators fast enough so that they don't see the scene freeze up, like hitting the pause button on a VCR. You don't see that happen. And if you hit the pause button, then hit the fast forward and see a few things happen really quickly. You want everything to unfold smoothly like it would in real life. Those are the design objectives of DIS. In this lecture, we don't go into great detail on how the DIS protocols work or later how HLA works. That, both of those are the topics of entire other classes. We go into it in detail for about an hour and a half in the three-day course and then their entire three days worth of courses on HLA or DIS which you can take if you want to know a lot more about those. DIS is also used in some video games. There's a company named Mock Technologies who was involved in building some of the DIS protocols and defining what they were. And they went off and built a computer game called Spearhead. And that computer game can be played over the internet. And when it's played over the internet, it's possible for you to shoot at another tank on somebody else's computer in Omaha or something. The network packet that travels from your computer to the computer in Omaha is what they call DIS Lite. It's a trimmed down version of the DIS protocol. And they essentially proved that the idea was viable in the gaming environment, but they were also emphasizing the fact that there's too much data in the DIS PDU. It needs to be trimmed down to make it possible to play on smaller networks. Here's ALSP. This is the family of simulations that ALSP connects together. ALSP takes the ideas of SimNet and DIS and takes them over into the aggregate simulation community. It has <coughs> a lot of similarities with DIS. If you looked at the list of PDUs from DIS, and if you looked at the list of 
um, interactions in ALSP, you would find that they have a lot in common. You'd be able to see the influence between the two communities. The one thing that ALSP has that the DIS community does not have is some control of time. In war games, you execute a simulation and you run forward in time and at any time you may say, let's stop right here. Let's jump back and replay that last hour because it didn't go very well. Or you may be executing it along and at some point you may say, it's nighttime. We're going to play the nighttime at double time. And so you may run twice as t fast as real time. Those are some of the things that you do regularly in war games that you usually don't do in a virtual environment. And so the LSP community supports the uh, control of time, both in moving forwards faster and slower and in moving back in time and starting over. Now, we've, we've jumped through DIS, we've jumped through ALSP, and we've jumped up to HLA. Somebody somewhere is going to ask you, if you're in the simulation business, if your simulator is HLA compliant. <clears throat> if your first answer is, what does that mean, you're in trouble. <laughs> I watched somebody say that one time. They said, we don't know what that means. And they were just, they, they weren't taken seriously after that. Here's what it means to be HLA compliant. There are three guidelines. The first one is, there's a set of HLA rules. There are ten rules that describe how your simulation, which is called a federate under an HLA environment, how it will operate and rules that describe how the federation as a family will operate. Five rules apply to the federate, five rules apply to the federation. And if you look at those, those rules, they're really binding you into the HLA as the only way to exchange data. They're making sure that you're not using any back doors or sneaky old methods to exchange data with other simulators. That's the first thing. So if you can follow those 10 HLA rules, you're HLA compliant, step one. Okay. Step, there, are ten there are 10 rules, right. And you can find those on the DMSO website. Uh, w, no, no W's. HLA.DMSO.mil. And you'll find more than you'll ever want to know about HLA on that website. So you follow those 10 rules. That's the first thing you have to do. The second thing you have to do is attach your simulation or your federate to the other simulations via a thing called the HLA interface specification. The HLA interface specification is a document which describes what services you will call when you want to send somebody information about your vehicle, when you want to take control of a vehicle, when you want to have some effect on time, when you want to do something that affects people other than your simulator, there's a service there and you will call it. Now the specification itself is not software. It's just a document that describes what that API will be that, re that connects you to the rest of the Federation. We'll get into what that software is in a couple slides. Then the third thing that you have to do is you have to describe your objects in the object model template format. Imagine ten different projects showing up around a table and sitting down to try and say, here's what we're going to do in a shared environment. Here's what we're going to uh, publish for other people to consume. It's going to be like a meeting of United Nations. Every one of those projects is going to describe themselves in a different way. Every one of those projects is going to talk about, one, one's going to talk about entities and events. The other one's going to talk about objects and explosions or something. Another one's going to talk about uh, units or something. But everybody's going to have a different way of expressing themselves. The object model templates try to get everyone to express themselves in a universal language, a language that everyone else can understand. So it causes you to say, here's what I'm going to publish and to say it in terms that the other ten people around the table can understand. And they can understand that not because they've studied your language for expressing yourself, but because they've studied the OMT language for expressing yourself. And so everybody speaks the same language.